Good evening, all. Um, we are uh, um, uh, presenting today uh, to you a Pumandal talk by uh, Mr. Raj Bhagat uh, Parnichami uh, from the WRI India. Today is going to talk about data-driven decision making and application of GIS and uh, remote sensing in governance and planning. Uh, so welcome to IEEE GRSS Bangalore section event. Uh, we would like to uh, show you a clip on uh, what uh, GRSS is all about. So this is just a one minute introduction clip. G. R. A. S. S. Is the IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society. Our mission is to build a community of researchers and practitioners by means of knowledge sharing and scientifically rigorous dissemination of the latest advancement in remote sensing. The technical committees are really meant for doing the technical outreach to other parts of the research community and industry. We want to inform our members and reach different communities via different channels like for example social media, journal and especially education. At the moment we have more than 60 chapters and 20 student branches all over the world. I love GS family very much and I'm very honored to be the member of it. Being part of GSS allows me to be a better research and professional, improving my skills and knowledge to do a good job. Come and be part of this great family. Ciao! So that's an introduction to IEEE GRSS, which is the Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society. Uh, we are uh, uh, we are quite uh, looking forward to uh, more professionals and students joining the community, uh, and uh, we enable uh, professional development in uh, the areas of geoscience and GIS, remote sensing, uh, related areas. Um, so uh, welcome to you all. Um, and uh, uh, for today's talk, I would like to. Um, I would like to um, ask uh, the slate member, uh, uh, Guru Dutta, to introduce the speaker of the day. Uh, we are grateful to all of you for editing the talk today. Please feel free to use the Q&A and chat uh, to ask questions as the talk progresses. We can take the questions at the end of the talk. We're happy to have you here. Thank you. Good evening, all. I believe you're all doing well and staying safe in this moment of pandemic situation. A brief introduction about today's Bhumandal talk speaker. Mr. Raj Bhagat Parini Chami is a senior manager in the Sustainable Cities Program of World Resource Institute, WRI India. He is a postgraduate from Indian Institute of Remote Sensing, ISRO, and the University of Twente, the Netherlands, where his research was specialized in earth observation and geoinformatics. Mr. Raj holds a graduate degree in civil engineering from St. Xavier's Catholic College of Engineering, Anna University, Chennai. Mr. Raj has been supporting multiple projects of WRI India in the fields of urban development, water resources, and transport since 2015. In today's talk, Mr. Raj focuses on the concept of data-driven decision-making and how GIS and remote sensing are being applied and adopted by WRI India's geoanalytics team. A bit of housekeeping before we get started. Kindly remain on mute throughout the webinar. If you have questions, please post them in the Q&A window. Questions will be answered towards the end of the webinar. Thank you. Over to you, Mr. Raj. I thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. Thank you for the wonderful introduction as well. Thank you for inviting me here. And uh, it's a lovely day. And I want to talk about this data-driven decision making. Um, so basically, what? It, uh, so I'll just explain how this slide deck is uh, arranged. Um, I'll just talk about uh, what we do in WRI India with uh, respect to GIS remote sensing roughly. Um, and uh, we call that a team, uh, we call that geoanalytics team. Um, I'll talk about that. And after that, uh, I'll talk about uh, our uh, vision, what we are trying to create and some examples. And before going into the examples, I'll just talk about how to design, uh, you know, an, uh, a study or a research that is focusing on GIS and research that will be useful for uh, decision making process and how it happens, etc. Um, so, uh, so as uh, 
it, it was a lovely interaction. I just want to keep the slide because there is this one bottom line, like it says 21 projects in India about themes of urban development, water resources, and transport and environment, right? So this is this is the most critical part of my profile. That's what I love. Uh, the thing is, uh, uh, you you would be uh, gathering more knowledge uh, once you have a lot of interaction with different different type of people. And uh, I had the opportunity to work in lots of projects. And right now itself, I have 21 projects. So uh, uh, roughly every day I have calls with different people from different uh, backgrounds. And that's where this uh, uh, entire idea happens about this data-driven decision-making. So in our teams, actually in WRI India, we have mix of planners, uh, economists. We have uh, uh, people like me from GIS remote sensing background. You have programmers. Um, so everyone will be there and uh, we bring that uh, conversation and we try to build that uh, uh, narrative around, uh, uh, you know, how to make things better, right? So that's where it is coming from and that's my privilege and I really love working in that. That's what I think is the biggest advantage for me. Uh, right now itself, I have a lot of projects and uh, in the past I had uh, the opportunity to work with a lot of folks that way. So uh, folks, if you're uh, not aware of what WRI India is and what we do is, uh, WRI India is actually a research organization, a research to uh, action organization actually. So what we do is uh, we do uh, high-end research and we provide uh, uh, suggestions to the government um, or community um, uh, on how to make things better, how to make your uh, livelihood better. That is the uh, whole idea about it. Um, so it involves, um, as I said, like uh, there will be progr programmers, you'll have economists, you have urban planners, uh, you have civil engineers, uh, everyone will be there and uh, we'll be talking about specific issues and uh, how we can build policies or guidelines or uh, uh, some kind of a ground related action, uh, how it can uh, work in the, uh, you know, in the real world, that's the concept of it. Um, so WRI India has uh, offices in multiple countries and uh, sorry, WRI has an office in multiple countries. WRI India is the uh, sister organization of it. And uh, so within that, I work with a team called uh, uh, Geoanalytics and uh, this is our vision. So what, what, what it means is that, uh, uh, I mean, what it is actually as we have just made sure that the sentence is as short as possible. So basically we want our cities to make uh, uh, planning and governance decisions um, that are economically competitive, environmentally sustainable and equitable through state-of-the-art data analytics tools and models. So this is our goal and this is what we want to achieve. Um, so why do we want to do this is a uh, uh, question, right? So uh, one of the biggest uh, drawbacks that we see in the uh, world of governance and planning is that uh, uh, the integration of scientific data, scientific uh, uh, analysis, the insights from those, those are not getting translated into a, uh, into a planning, um, uh, into the planning world. So you don't see much, uh, for example, uh, if you are looking at master plans of um, many cities across India, you will notice there are lots and lots of lapses. Uh, there will be so many lapses. Uh, these, these are not necessarily corruption. These are uh, um, uh, related to, uh, you know, lack of capacity. There are so many problems. I'll come into that. But uh, uh, there are so many things that are uh, lacking in our planning and governance, right? So this is what we want to uh, fill in. And uh, now the problem is that there will be certain set of bureaucrats, there will be politicians, and everyone comes with the baggage, including us also, right? You, me, and everyone who is, who is listening to this. Uh, we always come with a personal baggage. We have a perception about things. We think that this is better or the other thing is better. Uh, and uh, this personal baggage always has a bias towards, um, towards it. And uh, this affects the planning process is what we have observed. So for example, uh, any decision that uh, if you are asking right now to, uh, um, you know, a good majority of, uh, uh, you know, urban citizens, they will think about it in a very different way when compared with a uh, low income or a rural uh, uh, set of people, right? So these, these things are uh, affecting, these biases are affecting the planning and governance decisions. So what we want to do is bring in data analytics tools so that the process of it becomes more objective rather than subjective. 
So it will not be a, uh, it will not be just a, a decision because uh, say for example one one thing is that uh, if I ask you to uh, offset temperature in cities and uh, say uh, let's say plant trees. Uh, so everyone will be like, uh, trees should be planted everywhere or here, there, etc. They have their own perceptions, right? So, but what we want to do is that uh, when a government officer is going to uh, do such a project, we want to give him the data, we want to give him the analysis and the um, insights so that the decision is being taken with a clear conscience of what is happening, what would be the best practice and what will it result in. Right? So this kind of clarity will be, you know, will be there only if we bring in data. It doesn't mean that uh, government officers don't do any data analytics, but uh, it is largely decided by a perspective uh, and a subjective, uh, 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 you know, bias. It's coming from that bias and uh, that is dominating over the data analytics. Um, so everybody comes with that baggage. That's what we are trying to disrupt. Uh, we want to bring in more uh, uh, subjective, uh, sorry, more, more objective uh, analysis into the decision making process. So, um, so how do we do this is that uh, um, in my team, I bring in a lot of remote sensing and GIS as my background is that I bring in a lot of big data, I bring in uh, tools like uh, machine learning, etc. It's not necessarily data, I'm bringing in tools as well. Um, so a lot of these methodologies and everything around that, I bring in a lot of that. That is what we use. And uh, what do we do with it? Uh, we build researchers, we start to analyze what's happening, we try to figure out uh, what caused it or uh, causality analysis or anything like that. Uh, we build prototype tools like, uh, uh, you know, like it can be uh, scenario models, it can be websites, it can be anything of that sort. Uh, we build policies, we build what is the, what would be the right policy considering these analysis, these researchers, and uh, we do capacity building. And uh, unfortunately in the last uh, uh, one and a half years since COVID, we haven't done any capacity building exercises, but we used to uh, train government officers and uh, uh, folks who are, uh, you know, uh, really interested in this. Uh, we try to take them and we uh, build capacity in them um, so that they can also do all the stuff that we are doing. Uh, and what we are expecting is that through uh, these, uh, we are expecting that uh, the planning process becomes more integrated uh, with a holistic with holistic ideas coming into their uh, uh, heads before making decisions. And their decisions are dependent on data that is informed decision making. Um, and uh, through uh, uh, you know, since we are making it more uh, data oriented, we'll make it. Uh, we are likely to make it more transparent. The process will be more transparent. And uh, uh, through our capacity building and uh, through, uh, through the uh, handholding exercises that we do, we are uh, expecting that this will be replicated in the future without um, me or WRI India by the government. That is the idea that uh, this is our approach to the entire thing. So how it happens, this is a, this is a very old photograph. Uh, every time I show the slide, I'm saying this, but uh, I like to have it. Uh, so. Uh, on the left side, what you have is a map. Uh, you'll bring hundreds of maps this way. Uh, we'll bring lots of these maps. We'll bring in lots of uh, charts, uh, tools, uh, I mean, uh, insights. Uh, we'll have uh, clear uh, uh, analysis of what's happening. And then we bring all of them together. And uh, then we sit with the government officials to make, uh, you know, uh, planning a better way, right? So this, is, uh, this was for a master plan in uh, Chikbalapur that we did in 2016 or 17. I don't remember the exact year. Uh, but somewhere around that, we did a we were assisting the government with the master plan of the satellite town for Bangalore. So, uh, so this is what we brought in. So we bring in all this data. This is how it works, just to give you an understanding of what it is. Um, now, before going into this, you have to understand certain things. So uh, that is what I call the setting. That is, you need to understand the environment where you are working. Uh, this is something that majority of us uh, lack in understanding. And uh, that has been creating a lot of problem as well uh, from the technical side, as well as the government side, both the sides, it's a problem because uh, let me explain. So first is we are assisting governments. We are assisting local governments. We are assisting state governments. We are assisting union government. Uh, so in all the cases, you have to understand that there is a lack of adequate resources. It can be human material or financial. 
but uh, there is lack of resources. What does that mean? Um, you might have uh, some brilliant technology, you might have some brilliant science behind yours, but uh, a government official might not be able to recreate yours, um, might not be able to be more creative about uh, you know, data analytics in the way that uh, you are looking at it, right? So it will, it will not be the same. Uh, the second is applications and visualizations have not been demonstrated well for Indian cases. This is a big, big problem uh, because um, um, even if officials are creative, uh, what happens is that um, uh, majority of our projects are given to consultants and they just do it just like that, you know, uh, create all the post offices, uh, I mean, digitize all the locations of post offices, digitize all the locations of ATM, it is critical, but they just leave it over there. Um, that means they are not having any applications. So the government officer will be like, uh, what is next? Yeah, I, I, you marked all the post offices, you marked all the roads, you marked all this, that, etc. But what next? What is there for me? Uh, how do I uh, take it forward? Now, there is a, uh, I mean, you might think that there are solutions attached to it. You might think that we can do these, that, etc. But in reality, it is not working in that way. And a uh, lot of these data, uh, have been created and uh, they are just sitting in silos because they are not used properly. And uh, now an, another officer, when he sees that, uh, the immediate decision they say is like, you know, the previous guy did, we didn't have anything coming out of it. So I don't think we'll pursue it. This is the kind of uh, mentality that is there. So this is what we need to break. Um, and then the uh, public agencies always tend to act as silos. That is one department has a tend I mean, this is existent in every other, every organization, not just government, but uh, one department works, uh, you know, uh, in one way, another department works in another way. So they act in, act, act as silos, they create, uh, store data in different, different uh, uh, methods and uh, framework and everything. And uh, there is no intro, proper intro between these departments. It doesn't mean that we have to centralize everything, but there is a problem of, understanding between these agencies. And they, since it is going in a project mode and not as a, uh, um, not as a uh, more collective approach, it's uh, having that kind of a trouble. So this, these all are leading into underutilization of data that was already collected by the government. There are thousands and thousands of documents that are sitting in offices that, that could be very useful for the public to make uh, decisions, but they are not coming out because of the previous issues. So now, along with it, there are two other issues where the this is slightly you can say corrupt or whatever it is, but uh, there is a perception towards power right there. You know, uh, once you get the data, you don't share it. Um, so uh, me not sharing or you not sharing is a different thing, but government not sharing what are, what is created with tax money is a different problem. Um, now that leads to um, I mean that that is rooted in different uh, things that is uh, primarily per perception power but also fear of exposure of errors malpractice or any other form of rational criticism even they don't want that to happen let's say for example a piping network very few cities have opened that data uh, why because uh, they don't want to they don't want public to act uh, you know in a it will make people very these are sensitive right people people can get angry and even if the pipeline data is opened the flow amount in the pipeline will not be open. That kind of things always exist. Uh, so this is the setting. I'm just giving you a context of the setting that we are working in. Uh, we have to understand that we have to understand and we have to make sure that uh, we address all these issues and uh, uh, you know overcome these issues uh, so that we can have a proper decision making process. So a lot of it from my view also, these are all coming from my experiences of working, uh, not through, uh, you know, um, documented process, I'll say, but uh, these are this is the setting. We have to understand it. That's it. Uh, um, before going into the research and stuff. Uh, so this means you need to create your researches in a specific manner that uh, would be more useful, right? So uh, the thing is, um, as I as I earlier pointed out, uh, government officers are worried that you are not uh, tuning your research to application. Uh, you are having problems related to resources um, and you are having uh, problems in data sharing and uh, so many stuff. 
Right, so with that, we have to go into the, uh, you know, with this setting, we have to understand how to design the research uh, in a way so that it can be taken up uh, easily in the future. That is what I try to do. Uh, so in such a thing, there are four concepts that I always try to focus on. First is purpose, second is science, third is technology, and fourth is art. Uh, now, um, the fourth part, art is something that, uh, I despised when I was studying a long time ago, but uh, uh, I thought art is not required, but trust me, that is the most important aspect of all of them. Uh, I mean, not most, but uh, maybe purpose is the most, but art immediately follows it. If you want to have an applicable research, you need to be artistic about the data. You have to be artistic about uh, the way you disseminate data and only then it can be achieved. So anyway, I'll go into the details of it, how and what these mean. Now, the first one is purpose. Um, now, this is where many folks get it wrong and uh, where uh, there is a lot of error and everything. Uh, people don't understand why they are doing what they are doing. Um, and they just started a research because it's a cool research or something like that. They are interested in it. Um, yeah, fine. but. Uh, what does it serve, right? That, that, that's the critical question that the government officer is asking me, right? It's not looking at a uh, random forest model. He's not looking at uh, a Bayesian classifier or whatever it is. They are looking at what answers are you going to give it to me, right? So for that, you need to understand the purpose. Purpose has to be very clearly defined before you step into the research, very clearly defined. You have to, uh, I hope my connection is stable. Just got a message saying that it's unstable, but anyway, uh, there is a huge problem um, of people not understanding this, and they create uh, researchers without the head. And uh, this is where it becomes critical. Now, what is purpose? Um, when you are doing an analysis, you need to know what you are going to do, why you are going to do this, whom are you going to address. Those kind of things you need to list it down very clearly, and uh, you have to connect the problem and data very clearly. Now, what does that mean? Is that you are not going to go behind technology. You are not, uh, don't say that, uh, you know, I have an amazing data. Now I have to find some way to use it. No, I mean, that can, you can have an interest that way. I'm not going to say that uh, completely no to it, but, uh, but you have to start from the other way around. I have a problem of flooding in Mumbai. I have a problem of, uh, uh, heat related issues in uh, uh, in construction in Delhi. I have a problem related to wetland destruction in Chennai. Now, how will data answer that? Now, this is how you have to go back. Uh, instead of starting from the satellite image that you have, or instead of starting from the tool that you have, you have to start from the problem. Um, so I'll just give it to you for an example. Uh, one problem, as I said, was heat. Um, now, I wanted to understand uh, heat and I wanted to connect uh, uh, heat and uh, other parameters in the city. And I want so that I can tell the government where they have to intervene, et cetera. So first is, I understood the problem very clearly that I need to know what is causing heat, what are the factors that are influencing it. And the next is the solution towards it, right? That, that, that path has been very well defined. Now, for example, this map, was created with Landsat images. Um, so I have the temperatures and then the left side, I have overlaid that temperatures, uh, surface temperatures on that of the uh, uh, building footprint. Um, so in the left side, what you can see that there are, you know, hot spots. These are primarily because of neighborhoods that are not having any tree lined avenues. These are neighborhoods that are having too much of concrete or tar and those kind of things are there. Uh, now, this is having a direct health impact on people. This is the so problem that I'm going to address, right? So the problem is what uh, started this. Second is now I have identified the, uh, you know, um, what is the scale of the problem? That is the second step. Now, the next is once I have addressed the scale, I have to figure out how it is matching with other factors. And uh, we have to figure out what are the factors that are influencing it. So this is one, in Mumbai we did this one, we said that this is vegetation, vegetation is uh, sparse in certain places, so heat can build up. Uh, now uh, to offset it, remember that we are planting vegetation only to offset it, not as a, you know, wherever we want to plant, we are not going to plant. 
we want to offset where heat is higher and uh, because of concrete and tar and we have to figure out some intervention right? so now we need to target specifically which are the places i have a vegetation map and then i started bringing in the surface temperature and we began running the correlations now we went one step further into it we took only the roads of uh, mumbai and uh, where they are having trees and where they were not having trees and uh, we began specifically saying that these streets need the better designs that is how we went into that that is the second step um, third is again again associating with different parameters for example in this case i was associating land surface temperature with uh, roofing material and we wanted to intervene like um, uh, which are the wards in mumbai that are having high amount of x material of roof uh, and the y material of roof we began analyzing it and we began like one of the bigger problems that we were seeing is that metal and asbestos these were playing a big role and uh, most of these were in the slums and the low income neighborhoods and we wanted to intervene that and this leads to solution now i am the uh, person who connects the data and the problem and uh, the next is we bring in lots of solutions i didn't uh, put some solutions over here but uh, uh, we'll start like uh, uh, how do we change this roofing material or how do we intervene in those roads which are not having vegetation and what are the design problems and how do we address those this this is how we go in a research this is how you should design if you want to have an application oriented research if you are doing an academic research uh, that's fine i'm not, i'm not going to intervene in that uh, that is a different process but mine is an application oriented decision making process right so i have to tell the government in uh, uh, so what i found as correlating between uh, land surface temperature and uh, uh the parameters were vegetation roofing materials etc etc and these were low in particular uh area these are the areas where you need the first intervention to happen and there are interventions that are done globally and those these are the interventions and you can try it out now once it becomes a pilot we'll uh, make it uh, you know if it succeeds in the pilot we'll make it larger that is the kind of work that we do and once it is larger if it is successful in mumbai we'll take it to bangalore we'll take it to chennai will take it to delhi that 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 is the entire concept behind uh, how we work so first is you have to define your purpose clearly what are you trying to achieve and what are you trying to figure out that is how you have to design your research uh, second part is the science uh now see without purpose what you are having is uh absolutely not necessary it will go into a publication it might go into a paper and uh, it will be sitting in some government office and it will never be used if you don't have purpose but if you don't have science what you have is trash uh, so this is something uh, from the technical side of things people are fine with it but uh, uh, people who are more on the governance and the planning side they are uh, somewhat poor with it uh, but uh, here also there is a problem a researcher when when they are in an academic uh, side they are tending to be more scientific but once they start a professional career they have a tendency to overlook into the science and just do what their manager says now that's that's where the problem is first thing within science even though i should have separated this as data science and uh, you know uh, technical science but uh, anyway uh, first is data now i see a lot of gaps right so i see i have seen a lot of these gaps that are coming in and uh, uh, the biggest problem that they miss is uh about the first line geospatial data is about representation of ground reality you have to be very clear about it you have to understand that very clearly that is where people are getting it wrong people get data from x resource y resource they will say open street map is there they will say this is there that is there and uh, they do not analyze whether their data is sufficient to talk about the problem that we are talking about now that is very very critical if you are going to do that and many of them fail in this the first one first step a good majority will fail um in the second part i have seen a lot of uh, programmers fail this is uh, within the data analysis and everything i seen a lot of programmers fail and uh, don't be lazy about it do exploratory data analysis do manual checking don't automate the process don't automate the process always right so i mean you can automate it's not a bad thing but uh, make sure that you know what is happening with your data very clearly um you have to be um, if someone says that this is a problem with your data or the analysis you should know where it is coming from or why it is coming from you have to be very clear about it now exploratory data analysis 
is a good method, but it is not sufficient. That is why I said you have to understand the locality that you are working in. You have to understand where it is uh, being applied and how it is being applied. You have to be very clear about it. So, for example, yesterday I made an error. I'll uh, uh, talk about that. In Twitter, I posted a map of uh, uh, economic activity. Uh, now, um, in that, uh, I mean, the data I had analyzed very perfectly, but uh, while doing a map, I just made a mistake of uh, deselecting a particular city and then posting it. And uh, then later back again, I realized that uh, uh, someone pointed that it is not uh, this one. So, I mean, they said that uh, a particular city was missing. Well, people always say that this is missing, that is missing, but majority of them are not true. But, uh, uh, but uh, in this case, I knew that uh, the person was speaking the truth because I had manually seen a lot of this data. So don't automate see the data manually, understand and connect it with ground so that you will be able to create a meaningful analysis. So may, basically I rectified that because I understood, okay, this is a I mean, human error, not a uh, you know, research error. Uh, so in the sense, like I just accidentally missed it. Uh, that is the kind of, uh, so that kind of things you have to do it. Now, as I said, uh, um, uh, since why this is critical is incomplete data will always provide you incomplete analysis and is very, very uh, harmful. Um, so uh, oh, some time ago, there was a climate, uh, I forgot the name of it, climate net or something. They had published some data about the sea level rise and they said it's going to be this much, et cetera, et cetera. That is completely uh, nonsensical from my point of view. And uh, that is rising because uh, uh, it had incomplete data. And uh, because of the incompleteness of the data, the analysis became incomplete. And uh, the problem is this is this if uh, uh, governance and planning decisions are going to be taken by uh, folks who have, uh, uh, you know, folks who are depending on that data, they will mislead the people in the sense like they will ask solutions where it shouldn't be implemented, they will ask the solutions to be implemented. And uh, they will say that uh, the vice versa, if a place that requires it will miss it out. So always don't practice that this is all we have, you have to what you have to do is uh, you have to be very clear that uh, whether this data insufficiency, whether that is affecting your insight. I mean, there is not, a, there is no way you can have 100% data, right? But whether that will, whether the lack of any play, any data will affect your insight, that you have to be very clear about. That's why it requires a lot of ground understanding. You have to be very clear about uh, uh, what it represents on the ground. Uh, so, your India is a data deficit country, you should be very uh, well aware of that, um, but if you are not, you read the sentence once again. Um, <clears throat> now, this is the most critical part of your analytical um, work and you have to sp spend more time to it. That is, uh, so if you don't have it, exit the project. Now, <clears throat> with that, I'll just go into the next part, that is methodologies. Of course, you have to be very um, uh, you know, uh, critical about the methodologies that we choose, what is what works, what doesn't work, etc, etc. Uh, but make sure that um, you don't fall into the trap of um, um, this <clears throat> uh, falling in love with these methodologies, cool methodologies and stuff. That is, you bring in random, uh, I mean, I prefer random, work, but uh, you bring in all these neural networks, this, that, etc. And uh, don't push it on the head of the government uh, folks saying that, you know, this is a better methodology. It will improve your accuracy by 1.2 uh, percentage. No, that's not it. Um, you shouldn't fall for cool methodologies. You should produce useful methodologies. That's what you have to be very clear about. Um, now, this leads into the next part that is the technology. Um, now, many of you might have heard this. Uh, I love this uh, law of instrument. It says that uh, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You know, people uh, think about technology that uh, once they see a technology, they will try to figure out wherever they want to apply it, they'll try to apply it. Uh, so once you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? Not everything is a nail. If you, what, what, some things are screws, right? So you have to use the right tool. Um, so you have to be very clear and you have to be very flexible about the choices of tool. Um, so this is something that I prefer. I prefer Python a lot, but it doesn't mean that I limit myself to Python. Um, and same way, you have to be very, uh, you know, open about different tools and uh, you shouldn't be very religious about it. Now, for example, this map of uh, vegetation index was created with Excel. Now, when I say Excel, it's not even macro coding or whatever it is. It's not VBA macros. Maybe. It's just 
the entire um, you know uh, the tiff file the cells are shown here as cells uh, in the bottom you can see a sample of it so I just formatted the colors based on the value of the cell and i got this map this map is an excel sheet by the way it's it doesn't use any plugins or whatsoever so anything can be used to map but you have to figure out what is useful and uh, which you know makes the case here my case was why did i use excel because i wanted to tell folks like you that you can use anything to map now that is the purpose so purpose once it is defined be flexible about your tool now the next part as i said like art and communication is something that uh, i despised but if you want your message to be conveyed your maps should be powerful it should take the right insight to the person who is going to read it right so that is very very critical for example uh, don't show everything show the right information that is required to make the uh, inference so for example in this map i wanted to show a uh, reclamation of uh, wetlands and uh, it has three different time periods and one is shown in black another in yellow and another in red so use colors uh, and everything into your uh, um, so that, i mean into the advantage of uh, your so that you can convey the information uh, to the public uh, it can you can you, you should imagine data in a different way and it should be as simple and as minimalist as possible see people are not experts once you in your academic circles everybody would be uh, experts everyone will be having remote sensing background gis background everything they will understand moment the same app but in a generic uh, audience you will not have that many experts so you have to fine tune your map so that the messages the stories that you want to say get conveyed to the public in this one i wanted to show the elevation profile of the railway if i had used google earth and i marked it over there people would be like okay this is so much messy or whatsoever so i simplified it and um, i have been minimalist about it so it convey that information so here for example the story you want to say should be clear from the map and uh, here i wanted to say the urban area is in black and the municipal corporation is in red uh, most of the urban area is around the river and uh, what i wanted to say then is that the municipal corporation doesn't cover the entire urban area so as simple don't add too much of information just convey this information so that it becomes uh, right right so that that is the kind of um, so use uh, i mean these are complex visualizations so you, i mean this is make use of different types of ways to visualize your data um so um sometimes no data is also a you know form of a story i wanted to tell this one because i really love this one by the way uh this even now we are not having elections in tamil nadu for uh, local bodies uh, right now of course it's corona but uh, it has been 6 years since we had the lfi 5 years since we had the local body elections i wanted to convey this political message to my audience so what i did i created a map saying that these are the places of urban local bodies which have elected mayors and councillors and the map doesn't show anything and uh, that's how the story gets conveyed so this you have to be very clear why i am saying is a government officer a politician a newspaper journalist or a general audience they don't understand a lot of the technical terms around your maps so you have to take the right information that you want to have that you want to convey and con convert it into a method so that it becomes easily understandable uh, to the general audience now i'll show some sa sample applications now all these applications uh, will have these three components the first is count second is analyze third is build scenarios um, so what does that mean if you have a problem understand what is the problem uh, second is uh, analyze it that is what is causing the problem third is uh, build scenarios around it that is if you do x x intervention then what will happen so that way you can connect it that's how we go about it so of course you know how remote sensing can be used for land use land cover classification so this one shows land use land cover i mean how water bodies in bangalore but changing now this is how you count it you are trying to figure out what is the issue where is the issue how much is the issue that we have figured out that's fine um same way you can do it for built up area Uh, right so you can classify images you can do any ml or any ai algorithm that uh, learns automatically every time and uh, figures out what is the uh, uh, built up area and uh, now you have that you are counting the problem that is you are having this much 
uh, urbanization happening in this this place now the question that the government officer now will be having is what next and then uh, we say that you know uh, it's not just delhi we have counted for the entire um, you know country that's also fine i mean they understand okay you have done a proper research now that's where we bring in more researchers and we try to be as innovative as possible in these aspects now um, see uh, in a planning process in a if you want to do something for your city you have to understand where is the city growing in the how did it grow, grow in the past where will it grow in the future and what are the factors that are affecting its growth now this uh, slide over here this analysis that we did was to understand what is driving your growth so we classified there are you know built up growth is happening in five formats in our cities first one is sprawl and infill that is your city is just growing in its neighborhood just because it's expanding and the second is strategic projects uh, that is zzs or ports or something like that is being built and uh, suddenly people are going around it and then a highway is there then that is a corridor like growth that is the third and fourth is neighboring towns that is you have a big city and the neighboring town grows because of that economic activity and fifth is the, there will be some uh, some uh, random growth so now i showed you how it is appearing over here you can understand what are the samples right now and uh, now these are the samples now what are the parameters that are influencing it uh, so we studied each and every parameter that is behind all these parameter these um, variables so for example distance from the city core of the city old city or distances from the road uh, about the existence of previous projects and what is the uh, density of built up in the previous years and what is the current density what will be the what is the intensity in the neighborhood um, etc cetera, etc cetera. so these are the parameters we built now you have parameters you have samples so we built a machine learning model we had around 80% accuracy for this or 83% or something around that i don't remember the exact number but we did that analysis and we figured out what is driving growth in each of these cities and uh, as you can notice like in some cities uh it's uh, just expansion uh in some other cities it's uh, neighboring towns growing larger uh in some cities strategic projects are driving uh, that is uh, sezs or industrial areas they are driving and uh, these kind of things we began figuring out for each city then what would be the solution that they need to work on because you might plan your city for sprawl that is your city growing naturally but you don't plan i mean current planning process doesn't account into expansion into neighboring towns it doesn't uh, clearly uh, you know strategize the strategic projects itself that is construction of an sez or something and there is no plans for growth along highways that's why people just build along highways and there is no way for you to go to another road um, that is the problem that is happening so these all we analyzed and this is our insight we were saying that these are affecting it and you need to have a planning strategy for this now the government officers are like okay fine uh, now i understand the problem uh, now uh, probably these are the areas that i need to work on but which is the specific place that you want to work on so we want to predict future so we knew what were the factors that are affecting growth and we began building scenarios out of it so we began creating this is business as usual scenario uh, but we began creating so many scenarios around how growth will happen and uh, from 2019 this is for delhi by the way uh, how urbanization was there in 2019 and where we are seeing growth in 2030 and 50 if it is business as usual now we also be provided um, you know uh, solutions as scenarios where it's like you have an sez over here on a, or a new road being constructed or an rrts that is a transit uh, network if it is here then what are the parameters so we did a huge machine learning algorithm uh studying how these patterns affected in the past and we began producing it in the future um same way we can go into another problem statement so one problem statement is that flooding happening in cities and uh, not just cities also in the river and conditions so here is one problem that uh, built up is one of the causality behind it so we began going into that and we wanted to figure out where are these critical infrastructure that is getting affected uh, at the time of floods you have satellite images from um, radar images you have uh, uh, you have google maps that are providing lot of this information we wanted to collate them and uh, then we wanted to build scenarios as well so what we did was we began uh, creating these models of 
how much water will be flowing and how much water, I mean, which are the places that are likely to be affected, et cetera, et cetera. So we began doing that as well. So this is scenario building. These are the steps towards yours. And then finally, once you have that, you provide more insights into the government so that they can do job, their jobs better. So we began telling them where are the floodplains and which are the ones that are affected and how much of it is the statistics behind it and where it requires intervention. All these red spots are the ones that require interventions in Bangalore, by the way. And uh, you can see them uh, from newspaper clippings on certain spots. I just put some three spots over here, uh, how they have been affected and how our data analytics is bringing the problem right out. And uh, we also began providing them solutions, but uh, then there was government change and everything that it's lost in politics most of the time, but uh, uh, those kind of things. So similarly, we began building a lot of these terrain models and we began doing a lot of, right now, actually, I, I, unfortunately, I don't have, I, I can't show it to you right now. I can't I, actually, uh, but uh, we have created some cool graphics for Mumbai flooding and uh, we have created uh, places where it is going to affect and uh, scenarios we are building it. Unfortunately, because of COVID and everything, I'm, I, I wasn't able to collect some ground data that is required to validate the model so that finally I can hand it, hand it over to the government. So in saying that you, know, you can use this to understand the where it will flood as well as uh, if you build a, uh, say a new stormwater drain, which are the places that will be affected. For example, these are the insights that we are providing like uh, uh, which are stagnation in road, what is getting affected, what is not getting affected and uh, how, what are the uh, issues behind it. Uh, same way, if you apply it for transport sector, the same path we go uh, uh, from going from uh, analysis till the scenario building, we connect uh, the, all the dot, dots and my job is that. And uh, this is, for example, uh, we had the points of all the establishments in Bangalore, we had the uh, population spread modeled out and uh, then based on that we began finding out who are the people who are having access to formal jobs more and uh, through public transport we wanted to make public transport much better uh, so we wanted to create this one and then we uh, went ahead and uh, created scenarios like if you introduce new bus routes which are the places that are going to be affected now we can see that this was near my home in Bangalore um, so not necessarily that one place would be the, I mean, place where the bus run is, bus is running is the only one which is getting positive impact, but there will be lots of places which are getting positive impact because you are not going to crowd in another place, right? So that kind of things and all will be happening. So we wanted to produce all those results and uh, we began giving solutions in these ways. Right now we are, we are doing this as a form of complementarity analysis and so many analysis that we are doing in Bangalore. Um, we are assisting the Metro Rail, we are assisting the Bangalore, uh, you know, bus transport, BMTC, uh, <clears throat> and with so many of these solutions on how to, so this is how you do it. I mean, uh, just to, uh, this is a sh very short presentation, of course, but uh, uh, just to help you, uh, you have to be very clear about your problem statement. You have to be uh, clear about your analysis methods. And you have to count it very clearly. You have to step next to into uh, you know analyzing what is causing it, and uh, you have to once your analysis is done, you have to do scenario models so that now the government official will understand how this data can be useful for making decisions from their side. Uh, now once they see this, they will say like, okay, now what if what if I draw another bus route, and what will happen? Uh, so these kind of examples we give to them. And once we show the examples, they are more, uh, uh, you know, optimistic about it. So this is how we are uh, going about it. Uh, it's a very short presentation, unfortunately. Uh, this is the, uh, I mean, yeah, I tried to wrap everything into a 50 minute uh, one. Uh, I hope uh, um, this gives you some idea about how to design your analysis and stuff like that. Uh, if you have any questions related to the technical details of it or anything related to that, you can have it right now. I think uh, we have some some time like this. Uh, we can have a discussion. You can also reach me in Twitter if you want to. I post a lot of maps over there. So almost one map a day is the target, but sometimes I miss it. So anyway, uh, if you have questions, we can go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Akansha. Raj, it's a wonderful talk. Very inspiring, to be frank, and uh, really artistic. Yeah, so now I see why Kuruddha said that you are the archaeologist of maps. It, it's quite a valid remark. Thank you very much. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's really, really beautiful. Okay. We have a few, uh, we have a question on uh, uh, chat. 
Navjyoti is asked, uh, India has data deficit. So does it mean decision making using geospatial technology is not feasible? Yes, uh, you can't say that it is not feasible. Uh, oh. But uh, the thing is, thing about it is that um, uh, people get lazy about data collection. That's why I wanted to say that uh, India has data deficit. So you have to be careful about uh, being lazy. The reason is, um, as I said, like uh, you, you don't have road network, properly digitized road network. You don't have building footprints. You don't have land use model. You don't have cadastral data. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> you have to understand this reality. And uh, you shouldn't try to offset it with uh, some other automated methodology that again provides incomplete data. Um, now you have to be aware of that. So um, sometimes I, uh, uh, maybe I'm old school, but uh, I love digitizing data. Uh, uh, people always tend to immediately like, you know, why I have a remote sensing image. Why don't I identify all the slums in India? Why don't I use machine learning method to uh, digitize all the roads? Of course, I mean, you have some point about time and everything, but uh, to be fruitful, uh, it has always worked when it uh, when you digitize it. Um, so, for example, that um, uh, so last four years I sat almost uh, I mean not every day but I sat almost uh, uh, every day to digitize all the village uh, boundaries in India. Uh, so I didn't go through any of these uh, automated methodologies. I didn't. Uh, so uh, the the, thing, the point I wanted to make is that you shouldn't be lazy about data collection. India is a data deficit country. You should understand that and. Uh, uh, any any uh, data that we want to use will be incomplete, and uh, incomplete uh, data will produce incomplete analysis. So just a just a warning around that. Right. So it's do difficult. you have uh, regular sources of data that you um, that I mean, of course, data has to come from uh, credible credible sources, right, and verifiable yeah. and that sort of thing. So. Is, is there a set of uh, you know sources that you go to regularly? Um, I you had given credits for in all of your maps, so maybe you can uh, yeah. list out some other sources you take. For so your the, so there is no single data source that I trust honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the that is the concept about it. Um, there is nothing that could be uh, trusted blindly. Whatever data sources I. I verify it manually every single time. I whatever whoever is it, uh, it could be NRC, it could be uh, uh, it doesn't matter whether it is coming from NIC, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I start with the known locations first, and um, say for example, uh, NIC had the school GIS dot uh, or something like that. There is a website where they disseminate all the locations of schools. Um, I mean, it's not downloadable right now, but uh, what I did was I in my hometown I verified almost. Uh, all the schools that in uh, and manually I checked it like what is the gap that is possible and uh, what kind of gaps are possible and uh, so uh, starting from my hometown and then the geography I knew uh, like Bangalore, or, um, Chennai, uh, Mumbai and uh, Delhi these are geographies that I know very well uh, so I checked them and after that I checked for uh, other um, um, you know uh, problematic geographies that is uh, um, it, these can be urban areas, but what what about a northeastern state? Is it complete? Uh, can we verify that with Google Maps? Can we verify that with OpenStreetMap, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Once it re I mean, once I reach a certain amount of confidence about it, I might use it. Um, so there is no, nothing that can be trusted, and uh, every data source has to be. I mean, you need to know all the data sources. I'm you shouldn't be controlled as well. Like uh, you should avoid these data sources, etc. But uh, Take everything and uh, use the best that can solve the problem, not the. So, um, so, uh, so that asked a question on could you convince the authority to use the master plan you prepare? Yes, that, that uh, image actually shows the planners from the government side, actually. Um, okay. So, the, the, actually, it was, uh, to be honest, it was not a very um, something that we really wanted to do. Uh, but uh, they were really enthusiastic about it. They want to create that master plan with our uh, so. And uh, there is always a set of compromises that come in. That is uh, one thing that I didn't talk about. Uh, there is always a set of compromises, right? So um, I don't want to discourage folks, but uh, uh, there will be a certain set of things that you want and certain set of things that they want to do for different reasons. And uh, of course, I can't talk about it. <laughs> 
but uh, anyway, that, that would be there. But uh, at least, the, for example, one policy that we intervened was uh, in their master plan, at least. Um, they had, they are supposed to allot a certain percentage of it to green areas. What they did was they put all of them into a single bucket in a one corner of the planning area. Uh, so what we did was uh, we produced one saying that this is not well spread out. And second is uh, you have to have a balanced method of well spread out the green area in a place where it requires more intervention. For example, places where there was higher amount of heat. Um, so you have to do that. So we gave a map that way and that was integrated. Uh, but then again, government changed, the MLA has switched party. Uh, there are so many things that are happening in the background that affects it. Uh, so at least in the plan, it went. It, at least in the plan, it went through, but uh, it didn't. I don't think it was executed on ground. It's. Uh, I mean, that is another level of problem that we have. Uh, planning is one stage and uh, execution on ground is another stage. So uh, that part, uh, at least the data activities we haven't, uh, I'll say if we do, 100 projects, we'll have uh, 25 projects that uh, influence the planning and governance decision. And within that 25, you'll have uh, three or four where you'll have uh, ground intervention. Um, so Chikbalapur was, was not uh, that, but I took a photograph. I, I don't take, I don't like photo, taking photographs, but that day I took photographs. That's why Chikbalapur is always there in my slideshow. Um, yeah, okay, so, so that has a few more, uh, you know, follow-up questions and comments. So the administrative boundaries of different sources are different. How do you handle that? And but plans are not executed in the ground. And this is our No, that's true. Actually, the plans are not executed on ground. It's true. That is where the effect of uh, the art makes it important. Um, so that is where I see influencing people. Right now, there are many MLAs uh, who uh, follow me in Twitter and everything because the message I convey is no, I mean, see, the problem is our traditional method of conveying messages have been more on report writing and uh, those kind of things. And uh, people don't read that much. That's the reality. So if you want to influence, you have to influence it in the right way with a compelling graphic, uh, with a compelling set of uh, story with it. And uh, that's where I see the, in, uh, you know, uh, influencing happen that if that is done properly, then plans get executed. So now our success rate is getting better and better every day because we are doing that. In the last three years, at least, our maps are becoming more and more refined. It's no, no longer a, uh, something that only a GIS person can understand. It's something that influences the thought. It may not influence your thought overnight, but the constant flow of it, you'll be able to do it. That, that's the kind of, you can call it brainwashing or whatever it is, but that level of influencing we do every day. That's, that's where the change is. Um, so, yeah. And what was the response of the terminal ELBs for the mapping? That is, uh, no, I actually, it was, uh, I'll, uh, to be honest, I want to create a political first when the elections were happening also. And I wanted to tell them that this is something that uh, we wanted to create, but um, at least the current ruling party, I had a call with them once and uh, the, members within the current ruling party said that uh, they will do it post corona. Uh, so yeah, and uh, there's a delimitation exercise problem also that is associated with it. And I'm supposed to make a thread on that as well so that we can influence that process as well. How the wards are delineated and how it affects the electoral processes over there. And uh, uh, no, that, 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 uh, that is actually very effective, but unfortunately because of this COVID, it's not happening that much. But uh, I think uh, that would be a very successful case that I present maybe three years later or something that I'll talk about it, how that map was helpful in creating an awareness program. I mean, people know that elections are required, but uh, influencing more and more is, uh, I, I combined some Tamil movie meme over there in that map. You see it, uh, there is a famous comedian who shows his uh, pockets out saying that there is nothing. That is the legend. I kept as a legend uh, saying that there is nothing. So that people understand that there is nothing and uh, so it, it went viral. Uh, so it, this is like a dream job, right? I mean, you <laughs> can potter over data and, uh, you know, sort of put on your uh, investigator hat and then, you know, you can uh, find leads from and clues from, you know, starting from some story and all of that. 
So how did you land on such a profile at uh, WRI? Uh, I mean, is it some of uh, your making of the job or is the job like this? I mean, I map making I love, but I never thought I'll be working with WRI. Um, so uh, actually I loved uh, that concept. I wanted to be more along the politics side. And uh, then later I had a phase where I wanted to be on the research side. Um, WRI helped me to merge both. Luckily, I was very lucky. I was helping out a friend of mine and uh, she was working with WRI and uh, she just, uh, so the manager just asked her, whom are you texting? And she said my name and he said, uh, if you're asking help to him, uh, then I'll hire him. <laughs> so uh, that's how I ended a job with WRI and uh, luckily that was the and ever since that, I have never looked back and I'm currently not in a place to look back also. Yeah. Okay. Guess they keep you busy. Um, There's one question on the boundaries. Actually, I wanted to answer that now that administrative boundaries are different, sources are yes. different. How did you handle that? Now, this is the most challenging aspect of it. Currently, um, I was just telling Gurudatta also about uh, how we are having a problem. With, I was supposed to submit some uh, uh, data today. This is the final deadline or something like that. And um, that data, that analysis that we are doing is about economic geography of the national capital region. Uh, now, when we are talking about economic geography, we, I mean, it's not just the economics. We were looking at socio-economic, environmental parameters, everything in a single study we are trying to bring. It's like a massive study that we are compiling. And uh, at that point, it becomes very difficult because each source, as you mentioned, comes from a different... Uh, uh, the thing is... Uh, um, we began, as I said, like don't uh, be religious about a single model for explanation of everything. Um, um, we are supposed to um, we are supposed to be as flexible as possible, as well as very clear about the methodology and the science. As long as your study is not going to be affected, you can be creative about it. Now, um, let's say uh, let's say population density is population is different from um, the sun. Uh, for example, the 1993, uh, the 90s, uh, there was uh, this economic census three uh, that came up for Delhi for in a single district. Now we have 11 districts. And uh, so how do you do that? Right. So I began apportioning data. I began digitizing as much as possible. And uh, at, when I say as much as possible, I began uh, um, um, manually digitizing the data. It was written like, you know, uh, from here, left side, you have to go, right side, you have to go, et cetera, et cetera. So I went to the most granular amount that is possible. Then I began doing a meaningful apportionment of data. So based on built up or uh, at least 10 percentage of digitized data, et cetera, et cetera, I began explaining it. And that was a scientific process. So only through a careful and a hard work of digitization, we did this for one year, by the way. Uh, we did um, um, a digitization of around that. Uh, 25,000 polygons, uh, to my understanding, from text and everything. Um, so uh, with that, we began going into that. So you have, you shouldn't be lazy about that digitization and merge it with the scientific method of apportionment. You'll be ending up, you'll be ending up with a good, uh, you know, um, uh, cross-cutting study. Um, so at each point, you just ask your, ask yourself a question: Can my methodology go wrong if I employ this methodology? Right. So if I employ this particular method of executing it, will it go wrong? That is the question I try to answer every time. Um, that's one on what are the typical skills needed for someone to become a geoanalytic. I hire based on uh, attitude, um, whether they fit, whether they have that attitude. They, GIS, most of the young folks, they can learn GIS or programming or whatsoever. They always have, a, they always come with a small amount of knowledge. Everybody is going to be. I mean, we have a filter, right? So we always have a GIS or remote sensing. But I always uh, search for that attitude. In the first conversation, I'll try to figure out what uh, they are looking at and uh, what they want to. When I say that, I'm not going to ask a typical interviewer. I'm not saying about a HR type of thing. When I say attitude is that uh, they have to have the thirst for uh, knowledge and uh, the enthusiasm that I had. And I try to find if that person is having that same kind of enthusiasm and uh, or dedication and whichever role we want to fit in, we I try to figure that out. And uh, um, I don't I don't think the technical skills are the biggest things. You have to be 
self critical uh, you have to be uh, if you are self critical uh, then i don't mind the, whether the person knows python or whether the person knows uh, um, you know any any uh, js software for that matter i didn't even talk about rjs and qjs and i'm talking about the application of remote sensing js but i don't i don't i don't care about it because i just want people to understand uh, the ground data i just want them to be inclusive and uh, so that that's that's my mentality rest can be there they can learn as time goes on right to so come back to you on this one question uh, leading from there uh, rahisha has raised her hand so i'm just going to allow her to talk rahisha you can um, unmute yourself thank you thank you sir for a really informative session i have a one doubt because i am working on building food print extraction um, i have done for a, a maybe 2020 january uh, building food print i have done it okay maybe one or two words but i want to know that maybe in 2021 or 22 which are the session will be newly building will be there it is not possible for us to check it one by one because in the next year it will be new buildings will be pop up so how how you are maybe if you are taking for entire bangalore region you have a building footprint of a 2020 year and how you are understanding 2022 which are the new building has come how the manual digitization actually that that the limitations with the manual digitization did you get my no, point the, uh, um, no you want to figure out uh, where you want to focus no that, the thing that, is okay we have done a, maybe 2 uh, 3 months of work manual digitization okay maybe 30000 of polygon we have done it but maybe for the next year new buildings will be there for the maybe in one word maybe 10 or uh, 20 building new buildings will be there it is not easy to extract like uh, in the next year again doing for the wherever the new buildings has come so how you are resolving those kind of problem in reality this is happening right because whatever the data we have made maybe the next year it is not we are not able to use it because that is not the real data right so so here is the thing um the thing is um, first is you need to understand the urbanization pattern much more clear uh, what is uh, driving and uh, where it is being driven and uh, your target also you have to be very clear about what what do you want to study that that will help you a lot i will say why um say for example i want to study about uh, metro stations in bangalore the bmrcl that is coming up with the new um, line phase 2a and 2b which connects uh, silk board and the airport silk board the, we are kr pram and airport um so we want to have footprints for every year now it's the same problem as your some somewhat similar problem as yours we want to have that now i already had a previous understanding of how urbanization is happening um, and from that i began choosing the places now how do i do that first you have to understand the typologies of development uh, there are certain typologies and uh, how development happens in different places it changes you don't have to study every place um, but you have to be careful enough to include every type of development that is there so in the in that stretch i'll say uh, within three classes you can club all the stations i mean uh, the uh, amount of expansion in every um, station will be some i mean in three classes it will be in one of the classes it will be similar all of them will be similar similar uh, how much it will expand what kind of expansion you will be expecting etc etc that will be there now first you have to understand this topology now your study area if it is entire bangalore city you create it into a you know different uh, smaller subsections first um, say 200 300 subsections you start you figure it out now uh, these 200 300 subsections classify it into the clusters that you want to have right on what stage of development they have already had and what is what are the past uh, growth drivers in bangalore and uh, what are the potentials over there you record it and with that recording go with the typology understand how many typologies are there now based on that typologies you have to choose stations you have to choose this uh, you know uh, study areas out of these 200 300 subsections you just choose based on these typologies now that will reduce your workload uh, you don't have to do for everything 
Now you have to be very strategical about it, but you have to be very clear on what is that sampling that you're using everything. You have to be very clear about it. Uh, now there is nothing that is going to beat uh, uh, manual digitization. Of course, automation can be helpful, but you can attempt it. Uh, it's not uh, incorrect to attempt uh, um, automation, but you have to make sure that what is that you need to know what is the difference between manual and automated and apply that. So that is how, uh, once you know how much the difference is, you can figure out for each typology where you should be focusing. Now, I do not understand what is the, uh, you know, what is your target? Uh, now, if I have that, I'll give you further strategies on how do you want to go about it. Um, so as I said, like uh, for the two phases of Metro, uh, we've uh, figured out uh, digitized certain Metro stations alone. Uh, that way your workload reduces. So in 2021, you will change whatever is changing alone. You keep that data set and uh, create a copy of it, change what has changed and that's it. Right now we are doing one of the digitization actually. Uh, we are trying to figure out which are the buildings that are amalgamated, which have, uh, uh, you know, which have been um, uh, expanded or amalgamated or completely rebuilt or something like that. So these kind of five classes we have and uh, that five classes we are studying in stations and we chose the station strategically and so that you don't have to do it. Um, so that, that kind of strategy you need to have. I hope that answer, answers. But if I have a target of your project, I can clearly give you an answer. Thank you, and sir. I'll you. surely connect with you. Can, offline, I'll connect. Thank you, sir. Sure, sure, sure. When I say typologies, it means like, for example, core Bangalore is one type of typology. Um, so Indranagar is one typology. You have big plots, you have a certain rich class over there. Uh, Alsur uh, old town is a different type of typologies. That typologies you need to know. Um, so any typology that is similar to Alsur, let's say KR Puram, which is somewhat similar to Alsur, you don't have to recreate it. It will be somewhat similar, that, that kind of things. So you have to strategically go about it. Thank you, sir. So Raj, going back to the thing that you were saying about developing a story. So um, I, uh, uh, so when you look at journalistic reporting, or uh, when you look at the, there's a whole area which is called narrative visualization. Now, where uh, I mean, in fact, look at it from the visualization researcher community point of view. I mean, it's nothing new. It's just that it's a new name where they say that you know there is this uh, interweaving of how you construct a story with a plot, and then you have evidences to back back it up. I mean, as in, as the story progresses, you have, um, you add elements to it. So there are visual elements, there are textual elements, and so on and so forth. Right? So that's how you build a narrative. So uh, what, how much of it do you inculcate in your work? Do you need to do that? Or uh, it's something uh, that just... Almost actually... everything. So actually that art part, I skipped a lot. Um, so what happens is that um, I look at it in a I take a lot of inspiration from wrestling. I love wrestling, by the way. And uh, I take a lot of inspiration from that. And uh, what it is, is that um, uh, there are, uh, you know, three ways we do it. Um, uh, one is uh, the long-term storytelling. Uh, one is the short-term storytelling or short or medium term. And one is the, which I call the in-ring bout or in-ring thing. That is the inside the map, how do you tell the story? And how do you connect all of these together, right? Uh, when, when, I, when I say that, uh, I think I've uh, made around uh, some, I love doing it in social media and particularly in Twitter where I can post threads and uh, where you begin with a proper narrative. So I write it down like a storyline. I basically write it down and what should be the visualization. I have it, um, you know, picturized in my head, like uh, even for this presentation. So this is what I should say. This is the same thing. It has to be done in that manner. And uh, then we begin producing graphics around that. So we incorporate that almost every day. And, uh, uh, and more and more as the story maps uh, concept that is viewing around it, uh, which is, um, you know, which in which basically they are uh, saying that you can scroll through it and it will come, uh, you know, the answers, the slowly the evidence starts coming in, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it is the same concept, but uh, we have to be a little bit more creative as well. Uh, what, I mean, uh, first is we have to sit from the end of the user and uh, we have to just ask them like whether this maps. So as I said, short term story, uh, storytelling, let, let, let me clear, uh, clarify on that. What it means is that uh, the in ring or the in map uh, storytelling is that what is that specific map going to tell you? Uh, that is first. 
And uh, then in a short term storytelling, it will be a chain of maps, which will have a specific storyline. Let's say, for example, I want to talk about uh, uh, that same heat or uh, something like that. So first is heat. Second is I talk about vegetation uh, or maybe roofing material. Uh, third is vegetation. If I say third is vegetation. Fourth is if vegetation is there, then what about accessible parks? Uh, now, if parks are there, what are the fees for it? So, so you have that storyline, that is short-term storytelling for me. And then we have the long-term storytelling. So um, you have, uh, today I'm posting about uh, uh, heat, tomorrow I'll be talking about flood. But both of the stories will have some kind of an interconnected uh, uh, concept. That is, you have missed one critical point, that is, you have your government is not looking at data. That would be my overall story. So that kind of together, you will uh, figure it out saying that somebody is telling that uh, you should uh, do more of this GIS and everything. Somebody is telling that you can feel that. Um, but when it is done in an isolated manner, um, so the, gamma, the person who is going to see it, they will get influenced by it. They will not know the my agenda, right? So my agenda is like, uh, so the long-term storytelling will be there. Constantly, I will be saying this. So some some random time, I'll bring another one, but it will have some hints of this one also. So people who are following it will uh, slowly and steadily, they will tilt towards what I want to. That is the idea. So we look at these three levels of storytelling. And uh, then we have to build graphics, of course. I'm, I used to be horrible with the colors, by the way. I, my boss used to be like, uh, I'd send me some colors, I'll change the colors and uh, some. But, uh, Post my experiences, I began learning like how to, what should be. And that part, that art, entire art part was something that I started working after WRM. Before that, I was a pure researcher and tech guy. So going back to your uh, thing about uh, that, uh, you know, the main thing that you want uh, to look in a person who would work on such a uh, similar profile would be that you look at the uh, story, uh, I mean, the creative part and the technology part is something that you can work on uh, uh, you know, nowadays. So just to um, uh, take your view on that, see, when, um, so I work in visualization as well. So uh, I, when I learned visualization in college, in my university for my PhD and all that, um, actually we had to build a lot of tools by ourselves because we had to know um, OpenGL and C++ and Java to do that. And in uh, since like 2011, um, you know, 2010s and 2020s, of course, you see that there are a lot more tools that are available, which sort of frees, uh, you know, uh, professionals from, you know, doing that kind of heavy duty programming and they can focus on the story part. So do you see a similar shift uh, in the, you know, the availability of tools allowing people to um, you know, work more intensely with data because that 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 allows them that freedom or they, that allows them to uh, do this more uh, this sort of a more investigative activity, right? Yeah, exactly. So um, back uh, when I was studying, also we used to. I mean, my biggest achievement, which my staff really loved, was I managed to automate uh, the production of uh, you know uh, NDVI for. Uh, uh, for entire uh, South Asia for, I, th I think, uh, I don't remember the exact time step, but 110, maybe, maybe not 110. I don't remember the exact number of time steps. For the entire country, I automated the process and it was considered as a major achievement back then. Uh, but considering that uh, things like Google Earth Engine, when it comes in and it becomes two lines and it just takes two lines. And uh, so that means uh, you can be focusing more on the, uh, you know, parts that require our attention more rather than how do we do it. Um, so, um, uh, the thing is, uh, uh, right now the composition of teams that we are looking at is one core programmer or something like that, maybe two core programmers at the max, but, uh, but uh, we prefer more on the storytelling, the people who engage a lot, uh, people who can write about it, document it, uh, those kind of things who, those kind of skills are something that and also, it, uh, the, the, the problem is that people don't uh, develop these skills in college, um, uh, the most necessary skills, I'll say. Uh, see, uh, I do training sessions almost every Wednesday for my colleagues. 
So every Wednesday we used to have a Python session, GIS, QGIS, or map production session. Something like that we always have for every Wednesday, four o'clock we used to have that. Um, so I can teach them how to do this, how to do that. They can just text me, I'll just tell them that, you know, there is a menu box over there, this, that, etc. But certain things it's difficult to get them trained and it's a, it's a thought process that has to come in a long period of time. Uh, that takes three, four years of learning at least. That I can't teach, right? So, uh, so also the way we do hiring also is like, uh, um, right now I had, I mean, till uh, last, uh, today's 18th, uh, 15th, till the 15th, we had eight interns. Um, so that is the path I prefer. Like I take a set of interns, train them, make them understand where we are working and how they have to work. And uh, then uh, folks who are good enough, uh, they transform into the next process. So we hire people, we inspire people that I think it's this sentence is from uh, the office TV series. Uh, we, don't, we don't fire people, we hire people, we inspire people. Um, so <laughs> that is the concept that I've been working on um, so that they can redo what I, uh, they can always learn programming. I never learned programming um, in a formal course. Um, maybe a distance course is there, but uh, nobody taught me that. Uh, but I learned everything by myself. So I think uh, the concept over there is that uh, people don't have to be a programmer to do uh, data analytics. Uh, people have to have an understanding of data to to do data analytics. Programming, they can always learn at any point of time. Right. So in some sense, uh, you are a consumer of all these uh, GIS tools, uh, et cetera, that the community would develop, right? So do you have a wish list on what you would like, you know, uh, the, the GRSS society or, you know, the professionals who work in these kind of areas? Because at the end of the day, all of us have to work together, right? So yeah. do you have a wish list to tell? Uh, uh, yeah, the, for the software developers in particular, if I, we are looking at it, um, so I prefer an open source one. I prefer QGIS. Office makes me to use RJS sometimes, but uh, I prefer QGIS. Um, the thing is, uh, if uh, if if you want to do an application or in the data-driven decision making, if you want to address QGIS, is still something that is complex for a normal user, for a journalist, or for a decision maker. It is still complex. So we need a plugin in between. Maybe you shouldn't say even a plugin. Maybe a wrapper. That hides the entire QGIS and uh, keeps something that is useful, um, you know, that could be used for a quick analysis uh, for them. Um, they shouldn't be worried about uh, projection systems or this, that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You need a friendly interface. So you need that uh, light version. I'd say it's not exactly light version, but it's more more like an some form of a simplified version that can be useful for the these folks. Now that is the biggest thing that is lacking us because every time when we do capacity building, they are like, I'm going to learn a new software. This is not going to be fruitful. And I'm going to tell them vector layer, raster layer, this, that, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's useful for us, but uh, for them, uh, then the projection systems, it's, it's okay. projection systems are the biggest uh, trouble I have uh, trying to explain people that uh, numbers can be different when you calculate from different, different projection systems. So they'll be asking like, uh, my area is showing 1,144. Why is their area showing uh, 1,092? And uh, then I have to tell them that uh, they did it in UTM uh, WGS84. You did it in uh, this, uh, uh, you know, LCC or something like that, Lambert Chronicle. Uh, so you have to, you know, there are certain things that you need to understand, you know, et cetera. So that uh, is a very difficult part. So if we have to create a simplified mechanism for uh, us. And uh, that is something that is missing in the industry. And it's, it's not just uh, the open source industry, it's lacking in the entire uh, commercial industry itself. I saw one uh, company by the name Earthblocks who have uh, simplified the, the, who have created a GUI for Google Earth Engine. Uh, now Google Earth Engine itself is simple, but someone is building on top of it where you don't even have to write a JavaScript or a Python code and you just drag and drop. That makes, uh, so they showed it to me, of course, I don't need it, but uh, uh, but I was just telling them that my, maybe the people who we are working with will need it. But that is a re actual requirement though. So those kind of bridging, uh, if uh, software developers, if they can do it, it will be nicer. 
Second is, um, um, you know, established methodologies and scaled data for India, you know, hosting it. And that is something that is lacking in the sense like uh, we have academic institutions abroad that supply us data, everything. Uh, Columbia University has some, uh, you know, University of Wisconsin does some. There are so many people who are disseminating that, those things, but uh, in India, we don't have a proper uh, independent portal um, that disseminates. I mean, you have data meet, but that is just a collection of data. Uh, what I'm saying is more like uh, a research to, uh, you know, research data, locally created data uh, coming out, uh, that kind of platform and something that needs to be worked on. These are my biggest reasons. Thank you, Raj. Uh, I'd like uh, Guru Dutta or Nagajyoti to, I think I just hogged the whole question answer session, but I couldn't help asking you so many. Uh, I was just curious about how you do a lot of these things. So uh, I'd like to uh, invite. It was nice to see one uh, visual visualization uh, professional talking to another. <laughs> Yeah, I, I wouldn't be his equal any day. So yeah, I, I do research in it and not, not tell stories to a lot of people. <laughs> so that's, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's really amazing that you're able to inspire uh, a community to doing a lot of these things. And, uh, and your uh, target is more to, you know, reach a lot more people and inform them that, you know, that this data is there and this has to be used in a powerful fashion to, you know, move government really, right? So, so that that is like a, a very inspiring thing that you're doing. So thank you so much for all the all the work and the inspiration behind it. Thank you, Dr. Jaya and Guru Dutta for inviting me here. It's uh, It was a nice talk actually. It refreshed a lot of things also, some, some questions. Yes, it's, it's usually- so These are problems that we face every day, administrative boundaries and everything. So right, these are refreshing our thoughts and uh, it will be very helpful actually. Uh, definitely. So thank you so much, Raj. Um, I think uh, you, you spent a lot of valuable time and thank you for being patient with all the questions as well. So thank you very much. We'll, we'll be in touch. <laughs>